So I think there's been there are a few sessions looking at the issue of access to medicines and what the challenges are. And the focus of this session was to have an interactive discussion with a group of panelists who are experts who are really doing things and initiatives to improve access to medicines. And so a lot of the session was focusing on understanding what the landscape of solutions are, uh, what the challenges are with the specific solutions that are in place, what have been the successes and thinking about ways to scale it up uh, and make the model more sustainable. And we talked a little bit about differentiating between types of sustainability, but um, it was an exciting uh, session overall. Yeah, so that issue is is complex uh, and I think when we think about access a lot of people tend to think about availability uh, and and prices of the medicines and this this came up in our session as well but when you think about access there's a whole supply chain of access uh, that affects you know where the drugs are being manufactured so even before that you think about access in terms of equity to clinical trials so like what is the data that's actually informing the approval of these drugs where are these drugs manufactured how do these drugs get to the patients in low resource settings and so thinking about that, the whole supply chain mechanisms how governments and individuals procure these medicines uh, how patients pay for these medicines and so in a lot of low income middle income countries uh, cancer medicines are out of pocket uh, which is not sustainable so there's the issue of financial toxicity but sometimes when these medicines are available the actual like social determinants of health as well that affect access and so are uh, patients able to travel the distance to a healthcare facility to get the medicines uh, are they able to afford even when the medicines are free are they able to afford transportation child care so they can make it to the appointment and then someone actually brought up the big issue of stigma you know, there are sort of institutional stigmas, uh, internalized stigma and societal stigma as well. And so even when the medicines are available, are patients comfortable enough disclosing their cancer diagnosis so that they can access the medicines? And so I think thinking about access in a multidimensional way is important because it then, you know, behooves us to identify different challenges that we, uh, that happen across the sort of, um, continuum of supply chain and access to medicines and try to identify how we address each of these individually. So uh, it sounds daunting at first, uh, I think, when you think about access to cancer medicines and a lot of the information I'm borrowing from our session because these are the issues we talk about and these are the issues on the forefront of a lot of minds of ministries of health, uh, NGOs and other programs that are in this space. And so I will just highlight the four initiatives that we talked about. Uh, and so we think about sustainable models for delivering cancer medicines. And one of those is actually empowering ministries of health to include access to cancer medicines as part of universal health care coverage within ministries of health. And so we had um, the head of the NCCP, so the National Cancer Control Plan in Kenya, talk about processes that they have in place to put together a national cancer control plan that is informed by data in the country. And then that allows them to be able to forecast what the financial resources are needed and also healthcare infrastructure is needed to implement this. And so I think that is a sustainable model because I think ultimately we want governments to be able to assume ownership of these models. For different countries, that's gonna take a long time. So this is short term for some countries that are on the verge of coming up with their own NCCPs. For other countries, it's gonna be a model that takes a longer time, but one of the points that was highlighted in the session is that a lot of it also comes down to political will. Yes, I think governments have competing, uh, you know, needs of the population. So there's infectious diseases, there are other issues with maternal fetal mortality, but it, it really comes down to political will. Are we prioritizing cancer? Is it a priority for the government? Because when we prioritize it, we can invest in it. And so I think this thinking about that as well. Uh, we had Paho talk about procurement through like transnational procurement, so pooled procurement. One of the issues that we identified, which I didn't actually mention, was the issue that in a lot of these sub-Saharan African countries or low and middle income countries, the volumes of medicines being procured is really small. And so there's really no incentive for a lot of suppliers to meet those small demands. And they're really looking for like the huge purchases. And so the way in which you can shift that power dynamic, which Paho mentioned, is really thinking about pooled procurement where they have pooled procurement, I think from like 35 different entities, transnational entities, 
And by doing that, you leverage economies of scale. And so I think pooled procurement is something that a lot of people have thrown around, even for thinking about access to medicines in the sub-Saharan African region. Uh, there's also voluntary licensing, which MPP, so Medicine Patent Pool, talked about. They've done a lot of work in the HIV setting and the hepatitis C, in making hepatitis C drugs available. And that has been a model that we think we can translate into cancer care. Obviously, cancer care is a little bit different, uh, but I've, I was energized by the conversations around, you know, how this can really expand access to affordable medicines and really see price drops in drugs that patients can actually afford. And the last one I wanted to talk about is sort of bridging mechanisms. So thinking about newer innovative medicines that are super expensive, they're hundreds of thousands of dollars expensive that patients need now. So patients might not be able to wait for that NCCP model and pool procurement and all those logistics of voluntary licensing to be implemented. But I think what's important is that organizations like the Max Foundation bridge that gap. And by bridging that gap, I mean, they look at medicines that have high efficacy now, that there is some need in a low resource set. And so thinking about the patient who needs the drug right now, who has indication for the drug, who could benefit from the drug, how do we make it available to them now? And so I think donor programs, a lot of people frown upon donor programs as not being sustainable. I think it's a, an important bridge mechanism because the patients that uh, they've helped because these donor programs existed. And I think thinking about them as a way to transition, like as a model that eventually transitions into government ownership is a way to think about where they fit into that fabric of sustainable solutions to expand in cancer medicines access. You know, I think one of the, the, the big mechanisms that I didn't talk about is uh, collaborations with ministries of health to facilitate some of this procurement with suppliers. And so I know organizations like the American Cancer Society um, in collaboration with the Clinton Health Access Initiative are looking at pooled procurement whereby they work with pharmaceutical companies to set a ceiling in terms of how much they can charge low resource settings and, and then guarantee that a certain amount of drugs will be purchased for these, for these medicines. And so I think the different initiatives, uh, it feels a little bit like patchwork now, but I think given the complexity of cancer medicines uh, and given the fact that, you know, some, what the models that apply for generic and biosimilar medicines might not apply to medicines that are expensive, there's really a need for sort of multi-level and multi-dimensional approaches to improving access. And so I think these are some of the initiatives that, that are currently uh, working, have been implemented now. I think there'll be more along the way, but I think it's really energizing and, and promising to see that some of the data show that these have already been successful in proven access. I think, I think I, I feel optimistic because I think uh, throughout the con Congress have been going around and a lot of sessions on access to cancer medicines. And so sort of going back to the whole, whole issue of political will, I think there's now a global political will. WHO has launched an initiative with St. Jude's to expand access to childhood cancer medicines. Uh, WHO is also focusing on expansion of access to, um, I think I want to say vaccines uh, for cervical cancer, but then there's also the Breast Global Initiative as well. And so I think having that global, uh, you know, will to improve access to cancer medicines is a good start because I think a lot of people rely on the WHO for leadership. And so having, you know, the global priority that cancer is no longer too complex to tackle, but it's an important problem that we need to address now is really a good call to action. And so I'm, I'm optimistic that a lot of programs that we've talked about, like in a few years from now, would be expanded and we'll be telling success stories about, do you remember when cancer medicine was so expensive and now patients can afford it because ministries of health procure it. And so, um, you know, I'm an oncologist and so I have to be optimistic, but I think, I think the landscape is going to change. And, and I think it's starting now. Some of the dialogues that we are having were conversations that we didn't have 10 years ago because people thought cancer was just too complex to treat in, in low resource settings. So I think the future looks good. <laughs>